If you strictly compared the map sizes of Morrowind and Daggerfall, you would think that the series took a significant step backwards. But size truly matters not when it comes to creating a memorable experience. As we said, Daggerfall was huge, possibly even too big. It was also procedurally generated. What it had in scope, it lacked in story and theming. Morrowind was different. Morrowind entered the concept phase during the development of Daggerfall, and at that time, it was going to be created in a very similar fashion. However, it was determined that with Battlespire and Redguard needing more staff and the technology not being available yet, Morrowind would be put off for a spell. When Bethesda returned to Morrowind, the thinking was that it would not be another game simply like Daggerfall. It would be redesigned from the ground up. Every inch of Morrowind was designed with intention. What resulted was a much more immersive and satisfying experience than Daggerfall had to offer. Don't get me wrong, Daggerfall is still a great game and tremendous achievement. But Morrowind's intentional design made it instantly the best game in the series. Morrowind marks the first main Elder Scrolls game that Todd Howard led the development for. His lead designer for the project was Ken Ralston, representing a complete change of leadership for the franchise. Although Ted Peterson was no longer with the company, he still made his presence felt by contributing much of the text you find in the books and poems throughout the game. Morrowind is also the first entry in the Elder Scrolls for someone who is nearly impossible to imagine the games without, Jeremy Soul. Soul's score for Morrowind gave the game a depth and character that was not present in the previous titles. Jeremy has continued to make his indomitable music presence felt in the rest of the series. Quite possibly the most important thing for the longevity of the series though, was the introduction of the construction set during the development of the game. The construction set allowed the developers to quickly iterate and add new content to the game. It would be this tool that would be available for the gaming community to create new mods for the game, which enhanced and elongated the staying power of both Morrowind and the rest of the series to come. The game was a critical and financial success for Bethesda. A big part of that was the agreement to publish it for the Xbox, where a majority of the game's sales would come from. The game was also validation for Todd Howard's new vision for the direction of the games that he would manage. What I would like to see most personally from the next iteration of the Elder Scrolls would be a de-leveled world, meaning that the world wouldn't scale so much to the ability of your characters. Because Oblivion and Skyrim made the world around you level up with you in a way where you never really felt too threatened by the enemies around you. So for instance, you could venture into really dangerous areas early and maybe walk away with you know better loot, stuff like that. And personally, I enjoy the thrill of being able to level up a character to be able to earn your right to fight these higher level enemies in higher level areas. Um, that said, I don't think that's realistic for the direction that uh, Bethesda has been taking the Elder Scrolls games. I don't think we're going to get that. That's not the end of the world. I think that they could gain a lot from involving some of the more classic role-playing game tropes, things that we're actually starting to see more and more of now in your CR CRPG style games like Pillars of Eternity where your background affects um, role playing within the role playing game. If I had to choose something realistic that I think might actually happen in the next Elder Scrolls, I would say a better combat system, something a little bit more engaging and uh, particular instead of just kind of directional power attacks. Maybe something a little bit more along the lines of like Mountain Blade, where it really kind of matters what kind of weapon you're holding and maybe different move sets for different weapons. That would be cool. Now that you have more of a mainstream audience for it, I think you can delve back into the complexities that really made the Elder Scrolls series so interesting to begin with. Daggerfall was intended to have expansion packs, however, as we have discussed, they were spun off into their own games. Morrowind was the first entry into the Elder Scrolls series to have true expansion packs, and because of development of the construction set, they were relatively easy to create. The development of Tribunal lasted five months, starting on the day that Morrowind was released. Tribunal was set within the city of Mournhold, which was not accessible from the main Morrowind map. Players would have to teleport there. The storyline continues to tell the tale of the Tribunal deities. Tribunal also made some other cosmetic improvements to the game, and the overall reviews were positive. The second expansion was called Blood Moon, which had development started the day of Tribunal's release, just as Tribunal was with Morrowind's release. Unlike Tribunal, 
Blood Moon actually expanded the main map of the game to include a new island, which players felt added more to the free-form feel of the vanilla game. Reviews were mixed, however, on the added lycanthropy element. The Elder Scrolls series can probably be divided into two groups, before Morrowind and after Morrowind. Before, you have Arena, Daggerfall, Battlespire, and Redguard. They were all games that had value, especially Arena and Daggerfall, but had yet to put the entire package together. Morrowind and its expansion packs were the first big step in the direction of creating a complete experience. In terms of crossover mainstream appeal, Oblivion was the next step. Todd Howard mentioned in an interview that when he would look at the forums, there would only be a certain amount of people discussing Morrowind at any given time, and that when Oblivion came out, that number jumped quite significantly. It's more of an anecdotal appraisal of the game's popularity, but the observation does bear out when you see that Oblivion sold a few million more copies than Morrowind. Oblivion entered production as soon as Morrowind was published. While half the Elder Scrolls dev team worked on the expansions to Morrowind, the other half started its work on Oblivion, with Ken Ralston and Todd Howard steering the ship once again. In a trend that started with Daggerfall, Oblivion was not so much a sequel but another game taking place in the same world. Oblivion would take place after Morrowind, but the player character and location would be completely different. Howard's stated goal for the game was to take a look at what worked and what didn't work for Morrowind and try to make adjustments for the next entry, but also to take risks, something that he felt emboldened by doing on Morrowind. An RPG for the next generation, he called it, in a blog post on the now-defunct Elder Scrolls website. A web archive link can be found in the description below. One of the anecdotal criticisms of Oblivion that I've seen around the web it was that it was dumbed down. While that is a more subjective opinion, it may be based in the truth that during the design of the game, Howard stated that the game would be more focused. The game, while overall larger than Morrowind, would end up having fewer NPCs and quests in favor of more meaningful NPCs and longer quests with more variety to them. This lines up with the philosophy that they took with Morrowind, which did not have the grand size of Daggerfall, in favor of more meaningful interaction. Not all may agree, but it does seem consistent. One major change, at least for Oblivion only, was the return to procedurally generated landscape. The design team used procedural generation and then hand sculpted the finer details into the game. Technically, Oblivion, like Morrowind before it, stretched the capabilities of the machines that could run it. But Bethesda did a much better job giving players control over the graphics settings so that a wider variety of computers could play it. The game also shipped with an updated version of the construction kit. Additionally, an Elder Scrolls game was ported over to a Sony console, the PS3, for the first time. The game was another critical and financial success. As mentioned previously, it would become the best-selling game in the series, outpacing Morrowind's numbers. The game would go on to win a number of Game of the Year and other industry awards. Prior to Oblivion, most additional content for games came in the form of big, bundled expansion packs. Think of the expansions for Morrowind, or even going back to the expansions for Wolfenstein 3D and Doom, both of which, ironically, are published by Bethesda now. Oblivion took a different approach. While it did have expansions, and we'll get to those in a moment, the initial release saw the use of small DLC for a minor price. Not all things were priced appropriately, though. Horse Armor. It all started with Horse Armor on April 3rd, 2006. The Horse Armor, which provided the player's horse a set of armor, cost $2.50 American. Players were none too happy with the price of what seemed to be a minor addition to the game, and Bethesda listened. Following content would be released at a lower price with more content, including new quests and new homes for the player character. Morrowind's content expansion packs were clearly defined as such, but Oblivion's first official one existed in a bit of a roundabout way. Initially, it was rumored that there would be no official expansions to Oblivion, as had been done in the past only a focus on the micropayment DLC. Suddenly, however, an expansion titled Knights of the Nine began to hit the rumor mills. Initially billed as a PS3 exclusive, the expansion came to all platforms and added a new faction to the mix. Knights of the Nine added more mission content to the game, but didn't expand the map like previous Morrowind expansions had. Shivering Isles, the next expansion, would, however, by introducing the titular Isles by way of a gate that the player had to pass through. Shivering Isles was well received. 
With all previous Elder Scrolls games, work on the following game started when the previous one was released. This time, however, Todd Howard and company were focused on something different. Bethesda had acquired Interplay, the company responsible for the Fallout series, and set out to work on Fallout 3. I won't go into too much detail, because the history of the Fallout series will be covered in another video that I have planned. Let's just say that Fallout 3 was hotly anticipated from legions of fans that had been teased and tortured by screenshots of vaporware as well as games like Brotherhood of Steel that failed to capture the essence of the original games. Fallout 3 made it through a relatively brief development cycle, brief when compared to Morrowind and Oblivion. When Fallout 3 was released in 2008, development of Skyrim began in full. Howard, with lessons that he had learned from Fallout 3 and Oblivion, got to work with changes that he had in mind. Oblivion had returned to some of the procedural generation that was used to develop Arena and Daggerfall, but Skyrim, like Morrowind, would once again abandon that method of landscaping. In fact, it would not be crazy to say that Skyrim takes what worked best of Morrowind and Fallout 3 and used those ideals to develop a new Elder Scrolls game. The plot of Skyrim takes place 200 years after Oblivion and begins with your character in a dire situation, much like the opening of the other Elder Scrolls games. Your player is about to be executed for unknown, possibly non-existent crimes. Just before the execution, a dragon, which will be revealed to be the dragon Alduin, interrupts and kills just about everyone. You escape and eventually make your way to the city of Whiterun, and after slaying a dragon alongside the city guard, absorb its power and reveal yourself to be a dragonborn, one that can take the souls of dragons. The art direction of Skyrim sets it far apart from Oblivion. Art director Matt Carafano said in an interview with Game Informer that the typical fantasy style of Oblivion would not work in Skyrim, which is a colder, harsher world inhabited by the Nords. The phrase he uses to describe it is epic reality, meaning that wherever you go in the world of Skyrim, you have a sense of amazement at what you are walking through. One of the big changes in terms of gameplay, and possibly an inspiration from working on Fallout, was doing away with character class. In Fallout, players can develop their character's abilities however they wish, by way of assigning perks, and through the distribution of the special attributes. In Skyrim, it works in a somewhat similar way, but without the inclusion of special, Instead, each race provides a particular bonus, which you can use to your advantage when rolling a new character. Skyrim received critical acclaim, despite, like most Elder Scrolls games, or any game of such breadth, a certain amount of bugginess. Skyrim is the best-selling Elder Scrolls game to date and won numerous Game of the Year awards from media outlets across the globe. It's estimated that the game has sold 22.7 million copies worldwide. Skyrim, like Morrowind and Oblivion, had multiple expansion packs, but some of the best additions to Skyrim came from the modding community. I spoke with my friend Belmont Boy about the Skyrim modding community. The Skyrim modding community, and really the Elder Scrolls modding community at large, is the reason that these games have so much staying power, both from a gameplay and content perspective and also from a like cultural relevance perspective. Um, you have all of these people who, out of just sheer love for the game, commit their time and resources to improving the game and adding new content and improving content that's already there or fixing bugs that, you know, are in the box out of, you know, because it's a Bethesda game, so there's going to be a lot of bugs. Um, it's really this fantastic little microcosm, and it's really interesting to see how Bethesda has always supported everyone, and they really allow their games to be taken as this sort of blank canvas where you know if you want to change a couple little things you know something like maybe make some clothes look a little bit fancier you can do that or you can go and take your game and make it completely different you can make it like a totally different game i think it's really wonderful the way that bethesda has kind of supported that practice over the years in 2014 an mmo set in tamriel was released as the elder scrolls online it was initially met with mixed reviews the game is set long before the events of the latter-day games of Morrowind, Oblivion, and Skyrim, but allows for people to spend more time within the universe of the games. It should be noted that the main Bethesda team did not work on Elder Scrolls Online. The game was developed by ZeniMax Online. In 2016, Skyrim received its remastered version with updated graphics and 64-bit architecture. There's not a whole lot of information about what the next Elder Scrolls game has in store. If Bethesda has a pattern, though, it's that they begin work on their next big thing after the last big thing has been released. With the introduction of Fallout on the docket, I can imagine that pre-production of the next Elder Scrolls game only started with Fallout 4's release in late 2015. 
The matter of that pre-production, though, is uncertain. Todd Howard himself said, of course we are making it. It's a long way off. Now I'm going to turn to my panel to see what their take on the legacy of the Elder Scrolls series is. Elder Scrolls represents freedom. It represents the road, the, the big world. Uh, that's really what it is. Elder Scrolls was an MMO before there really were MMOs. It was a massive world that you could explore and, and investigate, and, and it's fascinating. We'll always be known for being one of the few industry giants that have swam upstream against the common practices of other mainstream blockbusters who just pump out the same game every single year with very subtle advancements. The advancements made between each Elder Scrolls game, on the other hand, are the furthest thing from subtle. I think that the Elder Scrolls showcased the um, inherent possibilities of an open world RPG perhaps better than other games had done previously. Um, I don't mean to say that the Elder Scrolls originated the open world RPG, but um, they really helped to bring it into the mainstream, um, especially with games like Oblivion. I think that really encouraged this very popular open world format that we see so often nowadays. Each release clearly shows a quantum leap forward, which they accomplish by pushing past the limitations of the technology that they use to create these games in a way that allows the series to evolve and set a new standard with every single title, all while remaining true to its story and true to the world that it's set in. And I think that that's the coolest thing about the Elder Scrolls games, that it is just huge. And it was huge before that was a thing that game publishers strive for. Nowadays, open world games are the de rigueur. That's what, that's what they are. That's what you want. They want open world games because they have proven to be so successful. And I think if there's going to be a legacy for Elder Scrolls, that when this whole open world thing dies down and it isn't quite a fad anymore um, and and people are focusing on other things game companies are trying to develop whatever the next big thing is Elder Scrolls will continue to be the massive world game that it's always been it's always been that way and it's always going to be that way thank you so much for joining me in the third and fourth episodes of origin of the series the next episode or two will be about the Dark Souls games. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe and share. I'll be putting the sources for the video in the description down below. Check out my previous episodes of Origin the Series, and I will see you guys in the next video.